we've got 20 people on. Just got a text from Adam that says it's working. No, not yet. Let me. You are now the presenter, so you can start showing your screen. Oh, now we can start the broadcast. Yes, and we're going to start the broadcast. So, yep. I can see it. And. Steve, I think we are ready. Yep. Good evening, everyone. This is Steve Nelson, President of Nebraska Farm Bureau. And I hope all of you are having a good evening, uh, enjoying uh, being inside, and and for many of you not having to travel somewhere to uh, to attend this. Hope that this uh, this setting of a webinar works well for you, and uh, certainly do thank you for for joining us and look forward to a good evening of information and uh, an opportunity uh, for all of you to ask questions. In the office with me uh, here in Lincoln tonight uh, are Jay Rempe, who is the Vice President of Governmental Relations, Jay Ferris, Director of Grassroots Programs, Jordan Dux, Director of National Affairs, and Anthony Arts, who is the Assistant Director of State Affairs. Anthony is new to Farm Bureau and it has been here a month or so, two months maybe, how are we doing? In November, so uh, Anthony's uh, been hit the ground running and has been very busy working uh, on a number of state issues as the legislature has begun and so we'll look forward to hearing from everyone. Uh, first uh, I will turn the program over to Jay Ferris and he will talk a little bit about some of the instructions related to the webinar and any of the details that uh, that you might need to know as we move forward related to how you would would uh, ask questions and that sort of thing. So, uh, Jay, I'll turn it over to you, and then when Jay Jay will uh, lead us into the next part of the program. So, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Jay. Right. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, hopefully, everybody is able to hear our broadcast uh, over your computer speakers. Um, if you as we go through, we're going to uh, have a little PowerPoint presentation. We also, Steve mentioned the presenters that we will have. If at any time you have a question for any presenter while they're um, presenting, uh, there's a chat button on your um, yeah. Oh, hold on just a second. We may have to start this over again. <laughs> I'm seeing a button that only us can 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 hear us so um, <laughs> we're going to try this again can you yeah because you're part of the presenter so I'm going to hit the broadcast this. is now starting all attendees go. are in listen only mode okay yeah we're going to go ahead and, and get started so Steve um, we're going to let you welcome everyone <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone, and as we figure out how to make all of this work, and certainly I think the technology is a wonderful thing. We have the opportunity to be together tonight on a cold winter night, and and uh, hopefully uh, all of you are are in uh, in a warm, comfortable room, and and uh, so looking forward to a really great evening of discussing and and learning about the issues that are before us. I'm President Steve Nelson of the Nebraska Farm Bureau. And in the office with me here tonight in Lincoln uh, are Jay Rampey, Vice President of Government Relations, uh, Jay Ferris, Director of Grassroots Programs, Jordan Dix, Director of National Affairs, and Anthony Arts, who is the Assistant Director of State Affairs and is, is uh, relatively new to the position and has hit the ground running as he has worked his way through a number of legislative bills with uh, the beginning of the legislative session. A lot of things to cover tonight, both on the state and national level, and certainly I know a lot of you will be concerned and want to learn more about uh, the governor's tax proposal, so we will 
uh, get to that as we move forward. And again, just want to thank you for being on tonight and, and hope that this is a, a positive experience for you. This time I'll turn the program over to Jay Ferris who will talk to you a little bit about the details of the webinar and uh, how to ask questions and, and, and those kinds of things and then, then uh, we'll move over to, uh, to Jay Rempe. So, uh, Jay Ferris. Okay, thank you Steve. Um, hopefully everyone is able to hear uh, the broadcast uh, this evening over the web and also being able to view the presentation we have. Um, it in, if at any time during the broadcast, if you have a question for any of the presenters, uh, there's a place over on your dashboard side of this uh, webinar uh, for questions. Uh, you can certainly type your question in and ask those questions and I will see that question and ask it to the presenter. Also at the end of each of the presenters we'll open it up so if there's any questions at that time you can sure ask that question. Um, there's also an ability if you are set up with a microphone at your computer um, you can raise your hand I will see that um, and then we can turn your microphone on and you can ask that question and everyone on the webinar can also hear you. So hopefully this works and I think we're ready. We will turn it over to Mr. Rempe so he can start uh, with our presentation. All right, thank you, Jay, very much. And I, too, would like to thank everybody for participating tonight. And, and uh, we're uh, trying something relatively new here. And uh, we're, it's always a learning experience. So uh, if you, thanks, everybody, for participating. What we're going to try to do tonight is uh, give you a quick update on some things happening both at the state capitol. And, and then Jordan's going to talk to you a little bit about things happening in Washington, DC. And then uh, update you on some issues, some of the priorities that Nebraska Farm Bureau is working on, and then hopefully uh, leave plenty of time for some questions and, and see what, what uh, is on folks' minds out there. Uh, real quick, I'm going to set the stage on, on the state legislature and then turn it over to Anthony to go through uh, a couple bills. But uh, right now, the legislature just completed number day number 16 of a 90-day session. Uh, this is, is the long session where the state, one of the big issues that kind of overrides everything, they have to set the two-year budget. And so in the course of setting the two-year budget for the state, uh, they'll obviously be dealing with a lot of spending issues, a lot of tax issues, a lot of priority issues of, of where the, the government uh, should be spending your uh, precious tax dollars. Uh, they had, senators had until last Wednesday to uh, introduce bills. They introduced over as about 655 bills covering a variety of topics. We're still in the process of trying to sort through all of those and put together our bill summary. And uh, we'll, we'll hopefully have that completed here soon. But in the meantime, they've already started hearings on bills. They've already started debating some bills on the floor. And what we're going to try to do tonight is we're going to highlight some of the, uh, the bills that have been introduced and uh, some of the issues that we, we foresee that we'll be spending some time and, and uh, our kind of priority issues for Farm Bureau. So I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Arch right now, and he's going to talk about a couple of bills, and then uh, and then I'll take back over and talk about a couple other ones. So. All right, thanks, Jay. So there are two bills that have been introduced this session that perhaps bloom larger than any of the other bills, and those are the two bills that basically outline the governor's two alternate alternate proposals for tax reform uh, here in Nebraska. Uh, both bills were introduced by Senator Bo McCoy of Omaha. LB, LB 405 is what we would call the governor's more, full, more ambitious proposal. Now this bill would eliminate both personal and corporate income taxes at the state level here in Nebraska. Now if those income taxes were completely eliminated, it would cost the state government $2.4 billion. And this bill is proposing to be revenue neutral. So in order to offset the losses in revenue to the state from eliminating these income taxes, the governor is proposing to eliminate a number of sales tax exemptions that cur currently exist. $280 million worth of these exemptions uh, would hit agriculture. And there, this would hit agriculture in a number of areas. First off, there is an exemption for water used in irrigation and manufacturing that would be repealed worth $824,000. Eight, 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 eight 
There's an exemption for artificial insemination, the semen used in that, worth $582,000. An exemption for seed used in commercial agriculture, worth $42.3 million. An exemption for machinery used in that commercial agriculture, worth $67 million. An exemption, exemption for agricultural chemicals. And an exemption for the energy and fuel used in agriculture, as I said, totaling $280 million that would be eliminated under LB 405. Other exemptions being targeted in LB 405 include the exemption for manufacturing machinery, energy used in industry, college and hospital room rentals, medical equipment, prescription drugs, and ingredient and component parts. Now the second bill that basically lays out the governor's alternate proposal for tax reform in Nebraska is LB 406. Now this bill is more scaled down than LB 405 in, the, in that it does not completely eliminate the state personal and corporate income taxes, but rather reduces them by a combined total of $395 million. And the major way it would do this is by exempting the first $12,000 in retirement income for couples and $6,000 for single individuals. In order to offset that $395 million reduction in revenue that would be brought in through the income tax, it also proposes to eliminate a number of current sales tax exemptions. And agriculture, once again, is targeted through the elimination of these exemptions. In fact, $211 million worth of agricultural exemptions are targeted. And these include the exemptions for agricultural seed, agricultural chemicals, and the energy used in agriculture. And in addition to the agricultural exemptions being targeted in 406, there are the exemptions for um, medical equipment, energy used in industry, and uh, mold, dyes, and containers. The exemptions for those particular products are also being targeted for repeal under LB 406. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Anthony gave a uh, rundown of the uh, the tax reform bills that the governor has introduced. In addition, I uh, just want to highlight a few other issues that are going to be out there in, in terms of uh, budget and tax issues. Obviously, the governor's not the only one that has ideas uh, as it relates to budget and taxes this session. There, I think the the revenue committee uh, was was one of the uh, committees that had the most bills that it has to sort through and, and hear this year. Uh, there are some bills related to property tax relief that we're very interested in. Uh, a couple of them of particular interest to us. One was introduced by Senator Dan Watermeyer, and it would uh, reduce the ag land values from 75% uh, down to 65% for purposes of funding schools. It's a, a bill that Senator LeVon Heideman introduced last year, and uh, he actually prioritized, but we're unable to get it out of, uh, out of Revenue Committee. But we're hoping this year that uh, maybe given the, the uh, discussion on taxes that uh, it might be uh, have some life this year. Another one was introduced by Senator Brosh that would uh, provide some, it would just go and reduce the ag land value from uh, 75 to 70 percent. And so it's another one. Uh, ag land values will be a topic of discussion too. Obviously we've always had an interest in looking at uh, converting to a productivity formula for, uh, for ag land values. Senator Russ Karpistak has introduced a bill that would uh, uh, set up a commission to study that and look at whether other states and whether or not the Nebraska should uh, adopt something like that in other states. Some other issues out there, roads funding. Uh, if you recall, a few years back, Senator Fisher passed a bill that, that uh, dedicated a portion of the state sales tax to roads funding. Uh, there's been some bills introduced to try to, to eliminate that. Uh, we've been, we were very supportive of that additional roads funding and we'll work to oppose that. A host of bills on state aid to schools, that's always a constant constant issue. It's taken on some, a, a greater sense of urgency, I think, here in the last couple of years in that over half of the school districts in the state now no longer receive state equalization aid. So it's roughly about 110, 120 school districts uh, do not receive state equalization aid, and so they rely solely on property taxes. And a lot, of, well, most of those are rural schools because of the increases we've seen in ag land values. So, that's going to be a big issue. And then lastly, sales tax on repair parts. Uh, it's Every year there's legislation introduced to uh, repeal the sales tax on repair parts on ag machinery and equipment. Obviously, we're very interested in that issue, too. Uh, voting delegates gave it special attention this year, and, and we'll be working on that. 
A uh, couple other issues real quick. Uh, we'll be involved in water uh, given the ongoing drought. and uh, It's raised the sensitivities and the awareness obviously related to water, water management and water use. Uh, and, and bills introduced in the legislation are no different. We're going to have a discussion on funding. Senator Carlson was elected the, uh, the chair of the Natural Resources Committee. He, uh, he, he's been studying the funding issue now for, for quite some time and feels uh, very strongly that we need to set up some kind of a long-term dedicated funding source to help address some of our water issues and water management issues, particularly as it relates to uh, some of the interstate compacts and, and agreements that the state has entered into and then some obligations we have there. So we'll have a discussion on that. And then uh, there's a host of bills dealing with management issues that, that will be uh, discussed as well. And the last couple things I'll mention on, on the state side real quickly tonight. Uh, uh, livestock Growth and Development. Anthony's been working on some legislation with Senator Ken Shields. It's LB 550, I believe, that would uh, take a look at uh, uh, what we can do at the state level to provide some, some maybe assistance and help for livestock-friendly counties to hopefully track more more livestock growth in those counties. One of the things that ways we're looking at doing that is there are some some uh, in tax, income tax credits available uh, in the state for livestock development expansion. But they largely go unused for a couple reasons. One, they're they're not very attractive enough, uh, and two, they 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 get what little amount there's there. They're capped at a million dollars, and it gets used up pretty quickly. And that that cap applies to not only livestock but other rural development projects as well. So we're trying to do some things there to maybe separate it out and, and livestock and have its own cap, and maybe bump up the credit amounts to to attract some some uh, development in the state. And lastly, just the regulatory front. Uh, there's always a host of issues there. We're working on legislation uh, LB uh, 249 that would uh, adopt the new federal regulations as they apply to farm trucks uh, that passed last year by Congress would adopt those in Nebraska. Probably the biggest change there is uh, concerning co commercial driver driver's license and remove the requirement that if you're driving any farm plated vehicle that you no longer have to have a uh, commercial driver's license if you're operating within the state. And uh, so Anthony just testified on our behalf on that bill earlier this week uh, in support of it. We have some cleanup language. Uh, we're trying to work on some hay hauling bills that we thought we had cleaned up last year at the particular issue out in the panhandle hauling hay into Wyoming. And we're working on that. And then uh, the, the issue of soil testing and whether or not uh, farmers and ranchers need to uh, notify or call one call before uh, doing any soil testing is, is, uh, has reared its ugly head again, if you will. Uh, Senator DuVos introduced a bill uh, on behalf of the utilities companies in the state that would require uh, if you, to uh, people performing soil tests to uh, notify or call the one call system. There is an exemption for farmers if they're performing on their own. But we're not sure how that applies to third parties like co-ops or fertilizer dealers or others that might be performing those tests. Uh, I think they would be required to call one call. So that'll be one that we'll be working on as well, too. Uh, I think that's all we had, Jay, on the, uh, on the state side. Are, are we getting any questions on state issues, or should we go on to national issues right now? Well, we can certainly open it up for questions right now. We don't have any questions at this point. But if anybody does have a question, they, uh, you can type it in in the question box um, over on your control panel, or you can also, if you have, we do have uh, someone that raised their hand, so I'm going to hope that they, so Lauren Amon, I am going to unmute your microphone. You can ask your question. Lauren, are you there? Nope, must not be. So, um, but you can also raise your hand. You do need to have a microphone. Um, we've got a couple other qu hands that have raised. We'll try uh, David Grimes. We'll see if yours is working. David, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Got a question on the two bills to reduce or eliminate income taxes. Has there been any discussion on? rather than eliminating the exemptions on sales tax to rather just raise the rate and keep the exemptions exemptions on. The, the question David asked was on the uh, two bills that the governor uh, introduced on the tax reform is whether or not there was any discussion rather than eliminate the sales tax exemptions to help fund the, the loss of the income tax revenue 
whether there's any consideration given to raising the rate and a sales tax rate as a way to make up the difference. And David, no, that, that has not come up in discussion whatsoever. There's been a little bit of discussion around it, uh, about rather than looking at removing exemptions on sales taxes, maybe looking at broadening the base, if you will, on sales tax to include services or other consumer goods that uh, would be sold at the retail level. Uh, but not, nothing's been talked about the rate, and I, I think they're pretty sensitive to the rate just because relative to other states and, and making sure our rate doesn't get too, too high compared to other states. Okay. Um, we have another question, and this one, does LB405 um, eliminate the sales tax exemption on feed? No, LB405 does not eliminate the sales tax exemption on feed. Uh, it, uh, for livestock producers, uh, feed would remain exempt, uh, uh, but energy, if I remember right, I'm looking at Anthony and he's shaking his head, energy would be taxed on a livestock producer, so uh, any energy you might use in the operation. Also, it removes the exemption for chemicals used in livestock operations, so hormones, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, fungicides or insecticides, anything like that that you might use. Would be would be taxed as well, and it, you know, interesting little side note on that bill or on those two bills, uh, particularly the first one, the LB 405, which is the bigger package with the complete elimination. We've been uh, obviously you, you continue to look at the bills and study the language, and we discovered a couple of days ago uh, the corn. If you had corn and you sold it for feed, it would be continue to be exempt, uh, sold as feed. But uh, we think that the, the bill inadvertently opens up uh, that they could tax corn sold into an ethanol plant. And so the sales tax would apply in that situation. So uh, it's something that we will probably raise next week at the hearings on, on those two bills. Okay, we do have another question here. This one is from Jeff Metz, is wanting to know, does either of the governor's bills mention elimination of personal property taxes? No, neither of them do. Uh, and, and one of the things that's come up in the course of the conversation is South Dakota does levy a sales tax on ag machinery equipment. It, and when you look at the, all these exemptions that are being proposed to be removed, uh, if they were removed in Nebraska, we would stick out like a sore thumb amongst all our bordering states. But South Dakota is used as an example where they do tax ag machinery and equipment, but they do not levy the personal property taxes on it. So now we we have uh, argued or, or argued in our discussions with the governor and others. We've pointed out that uh, we're willing to have a discussion on, on tax reform and, and looking at expanding the sales tax base. But we want property tax relief is, is our goal, and we we've, we've used or we've suggested maybe personal property taxes be part of that and, and look at that. But uh, no, the bills as introduced do not do anything with personal property taxes. Okay. Another question, uh, this one is from Dwayne and Rosie Sugden. Uh, would fertilizer and anhydrous be taxed? Yes. Okay. Short answer. <laughs> it would. Uh, the exemption uh, that they're removing for chemicals applies to not only pesticides and insecticides, and it uh, applies to fertilizers too. Okay. Any other questions? That's all I have that I can see at this point. Okay, well, we'll move it on to, we'll let Jordan uh, give a quick update on some national issues then, and, but if somebody has some further questions on state issues when Jordan gets done, we'll open it up for both national and state questions. So let me transfer the microphone to Jordan. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to try to run through a couple things fairly quickly um, and then, uh, again, allow plenty of time uh, for uh, for questions. Um, moving forward into, I think, uh, some of the things that we're going to be working on, and I think probably some of the more important things that Congress will be talking about, um, I wanted to hit on, would be, first and foremost, the role that agriculture will play in the upcoming budget battle. Um, <clears throat> we've spent an awful lot of time, uh, I think Congress has spent an awful lot of time talking about 
what government should spend. And I know we spent uh, time in January, early part of January, the very beginning of January, and then also the entire month of December trying to work through taxes. And there was an attempt to try to um, make uh, the spending part a, you know, try to take in spending reductions as a part of the overall tax plan. Um, and uh, if you have questions about what some of those taxes and where, uh, what happened with those, I can certainly go over those with you if you have that question. But um, they were not able to come to a large agreement, and so um, the uh, budget battle will uh, happen here uh, this, uh, this uh, winter yet and going into this spring and uh, the, uh, the spending side of things. We dealt with taxes now. Congress wants to focus in on the spending side. You've got Republicans that only want to focus on spending. You've got Democrats that want to talk about both. Um, increasing taxes, again, finding more tax increases, and then also working on a little bit of the spending side also. And so the question that I posed here is, you know, what, what role will agriculture play in that? And it seems anymore that agriculture is the, the constant target of, of uh, budget cuts uh, anymore. Uh, I listed a couple things there, research funding and the market access program or the MAP program. You know, those, those two things are, I think, going to be a large part of what we try to defend here in the next, uh, in the next uh, several months, uh, trying to uh, defend what we've got there, uh, and then also maybe even try to build a little bit when it comes to research funding. The uh, two proposals in the House and Senate last year, the two uh, Farm Bill proposals, uh, actually added just a little bit of money to research funding. Um, and research funding and the market access program are two, two things that uh, get targeted um, an awful lot uh, because, of, uh, because of just the, the uh, ease, I guess, that Congress uh, goes after them uh, due to the fact that they affect a smaller number of people. And so it's an easy thing for Congress to try to cut. I put direct payments on there also, and this is kind of a, a little piece of advice, I guess, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to the Farm Bill discussion. but. Uh, Direct payments could again be a target, not just when it comes to uh, coming up with a new farm bill. Uh, we are very certain that direct payments, and I know I talked about this last year, that to not expect on direct payments uh, in 2013, but Congress as a part of the debt reduction package or the, the tax package, they extended the 2008 farm bill and basically scratched out 2012 on the ending date and put 2013. And so direct payments will be there. Um, supposedly for farmers for this year. However, there is a question mark on the end of that because it appears that Congress might try to use direct payments to pay for uh, other things in terms of spending reductions. And so um, we are encouraging farmers. Uh, I think uh, we've sent out a, a, in the past what the sign updates are, and if you want to know what those are, I can certainly tell you as I, I need to look them up here real quick. But uh, um, to sign up for those direct payments uh, as quickly as you can, because there is a possibility that Congress might try to uh, uh, go after those. And as a part of that, going into the next one, uh, is uh, I think a, a connection with that is sequestration. Uh, and if you all remember back uh, a couple years ago, uh, Congress attempted uh, in 2011 to try to solve um, the debt or spending problem the government had by trying to come up with a large uh, spending slash uh, or tax and spending cut uh, compromise and tried to come up with this super committee proposal where a group of House members and senators were to come up with $1.2 $1 trillion in savings over the course of 10 years. Uh, they were unable to come to an agreement, and so sequestration was the doubt was the the next step there. That uh, if they didn't come to an agreement, there would be automatic spending cuts of 1.2 trillion dollars uh, just across the board. Um, and so we are kind of staring at that. Congress has delayed uh, sequestration until uh, it until March, and um, it appears from the conversations that I've had with uh, with uh, our members uh, on Capitol Hill. It appears that that might be uh, the direction. Uh, it might be the direction Congress heads. You know, people wanted to try to avoid sequestration, um, uh, mainly the Defense Department, because half of half of that 1.2 trillion uh, is going to come from the Defense Department. Um, and so, you know, there was this effort to try to avoid sequestration, but I don't know if I would say that that actually will happen uh, this uh, this uh, this year. Um, because Congress can't seem to agree on anything, and this is one of the things that is in law, and uh, it, it might be a step uh, in terms of uh, trying to move forward with some sort of spending reductions. Farm Bureau actually added in terms of our 
our national policy added uh, support for sequestration as a means to try to uh, at least somewhat control um, uh, federal spending. And the last question there, where does the Farm Bill fit into this? And, uh, and quite frankly, as I talked to research funding, uh, the two proposals um, that were uh, talked about last year uh, on the House and Senate side, they kind of bumped up some funding for research. MAP funding was roughly the same. Direct payments were gotten rid of. Um, and the, uh, the ability to write farm legislation uh, last year was you know, to kind of take the place of sequestration for agriculture. Um, and uh, agriculture, the USDA is giving up anywhere, and I've seen different estimates. Uh, the newest one I've seen is agriculture is going to be receiving a cut of around $7 billion uh, they're going to have to come up with next year, um, and so uh, under sequestration. And so um, you know, we were able to kind of direct that $7 billion and, uh, and try to decide where that actually comes in. And so that's why we were, hopefully, why we really pushed, excuse me, uh, last year to try to get a farm bill done. Now that we're facing sequestration, it appears that the number uh, that uh, we've been looking to trim the budget um, in terms of a new farm bill um, will be uh, will be a part of it, but then sequestration will probably be on top of that. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at much more significant budget cuts when it comes to drafting the next farm bill. And so I just want to talk real quick about the farm bill, also 2013 farm bill on the Senate side. Um, the bill that was passed through the entire Senate last year was reintroduced by the Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid. And, uh, and uh, Farm Bureau was happy to see that. We were happy to see that it come from a leadership position. It's not just from the Agricultural uh, Committee leadership. Uh, this came from the majority leader. It appears that he's interested in trying to pass a farm bill forward. And so uh, that's why uh, we, we were uh, supportive of that effort to try to reintroduce that bill. And uh, it looks exactly the same as what the bill that passed the Senate last year uh, does. So it, it, just, it just was the reintroduction of that bill. The budget numbers will not be decided during the farm bill discussion, as uh, most folks had hoped they would be. Um, they're going to be decided during this overall budget discussion, this, this uh, spending cut discussion that happens this spring. Um, they're essentially, the Ag Committee folks are going to be a part of this, uh, but pretty much they're going to be told what to cut, and that's just going to be the way it is, uh, quite frankly. And so trying to direct where those cuts come from is going to be our charge of what we need to focus in on. Uh, the timeline remains very unclear in terms of when we're actually going to get to debate a farm bill on the Senate side. Um, you know, we, uh, I think that you've got more of a desire to do it on the Senate side. I think you've got more consensus. Um, the bill passed the Senate last year, the whole Senate, not just the Ag Committee. Uh, and so uh, I think we're going to be looking at a farm bill, debating a farm bill on the Senate side probably this summer um, and looking for final passage, uh, hopefully before we get to uh, the uh, end of September deadline before the, this uh, farm bill expires again. <clears throat> Over on the House side, um, the bill has yet to be reintroduced, but it likely will be. Um, probably the same bill that was introduced in the House uh, before that went through the House Ag Committee, but did not see any time on the House floor. Um, the area of contention that will continue to be there will uh, likely be the SNAP program and how much the House side uh, cut the SNAP program. The House side cut roughly $16 billion from the food stamp program, the SNAP program, the Senate only cut $4 billion. And that divide um, is what really caused the problems last year. It's why we didn't get a farm bill passed. And so trying to uh, find a way to, for the two sides to work together on that is going to be important uh, if we want to get this farm bill passed. And then lastly, the timeline is also unclear on the House side. I think it's more unclear on the House side than it is on the Senate. They're going to try to, um, I know that uh, the Ag Committee leadership was trying to get assurances from the House leadership on trying to move this bill forward. They wanted to try to get a guarantee that if, we, if they took a bill through the House Ag Committee that it was actually going to get floor time. Um, because uh, they, they didn't want to waste their time. And quite frankly, um, a lot of farmers could live off of the 2008 Farm Bill. Uh, it's not uh, necessarily, doesn't provide the cost savings that people want. But um, you know, I don't think, uh, if, if there's no guarantee that this bill is going to see the House floor, I don't see a big push to try to get it done. And so again, I think this summer, we're probably going to look at a House uh, Farm Bill but uh, it will be interesting to see what the leadership decides to do this time. Uh, wanted to move in very quickly uh, to talk about uh, immigration because this is going to be one of the big. Um, well, we do have a question on okay. Okay. Go we, ahead. before we go off Farm Bill too far. Um, 
the question here is, is the House still sticking to the target price version versus the Senate's version? Yes, the House will most likely continue with um, this uh, updated target price program along with a uh, revenue program compared to the Senate that just had a revenue program. You did see a move when we tried to get a farm bill attached to the big, uh, when we tried to get this farm bill attached to the big uh, tax discussion, um, that there was an attempt to try to um, just connect the, the House version to this, the tax proposal. You had, uh, you lost some of the opposition from the Senate side on that. And the main reason is, is because of Southern producers. Um, they, uh, southern producers like the target price program, and so that's uh, that's uh, what they uh, what they wanted to try to keep uh, keep in there. And so, yeah, they they uh, most likely will have that on the house side. It will be interesting to see. There is a little bit of a political change. Um, yeah, uh, the there is a little bit of a change in the leadership on the Senate Ag Committee. I forgot to mention that uh, Senator uh, uh, Pat Roberts from Kansas was the ranking member, the Republican member, uh, the number two guy on the Senate Ag Committee. He actually was just replaced by Thad Cochran from Mississippi. Uh, and as you can tell, if you if Southern producers wanted a champion for Southern agriculture, uh, getting a gentleman from Mississippi as the number two guy on the Senate Ag Committee is the way to do just that. So uh, it will be interesting to see what the Senate comes up with moving forward. Um, I want to hit uh, immigration real quick, and I'll just run through this very quickly. Uh, again, it's going to be one of the main things that's talked about, uh, and I wanted to just see if anyone has any questions here, and I, I will try to uh, attempt to answer any questions I can. I'm not a, a, an immigration specialist, but I just wanted to run through. Um, you know, real quick, the bipartisan Senate proposal that was just released this week by four Democrats and four Republicans. Um, they wanted to try, these are just the main four points, and there are obviously some pieces in it, and the, the specifics have been kind of left out. Um, but uh, there is a, they want to try to do and come up with a path to citizenship for those who are already here, uh, improve upon the current system uh, while attracting the world's best, i.e., they want to try to keep and bring in folks going to a, a graduate school. Basically, the idea is to almost put a green card or staple a green card to the back of a PhD diploma. Um, trying to attract the world's best and keep them here uh, in terms of industry and trying to uh, attract those folks here. Uh, a strong employment uh, verification. They want to try to work within the employment, um, you know, the folks that hire immigrants and try to work on uh, some sort of a program to where uh, there is more verification that the folks here are legal, and if they are not legal, find a way to uh, uh, attract those workers that are. And then last but not least, admitting new workers and protecting the current workers that are already here. Again, that path to citizenship for those who are here, but admit new workers into a program where they can be tracked better and they can try to uh, work within a, a, a better system. Uh, again, improving, <coughs> excuse me, improving on the current system is kind of the main, the main thing there. Uh, and again, specifics are a little harder to come by in this in this proposal. And very quickly, the American Farm Bureau has spent a considerable amount of time uh, trying to come up with a new immigration reform package. Uh, and uh, the this is just a small portion as to what they've tried to come up with. Um, and uh, here's I mean the idea is is it's trying to work for uh, agriculture, those producers that rely on on uh, on immigrant labor uh, to try to pick whether it be fruits and vegetables and in California or berries in uh, in uh, in Michigan, um, they want to have a new USDA controlled guest worker program. Move it away from the Department of Labor. Have USDA control it. Agriculture would be broadly defined to include the packing, processing, and other related industries, uh, and so those workers could work within those industries. The existing undocumented workers working in agriculture would be eligible to participate in the new program. Um, trying to maintain the uh, the experienced workforce that they have and allowing them to participate in the new program. This one only modifies the current H-2A program. It has not been popular amongst employers. Um, it uh, relies heavily on employers rather than you know relying upon the workers. The H-2A program has not been, again, like I said, overly popular due to the fact that it push, pushes that burden of confirming whether or not someone is legal on the employer rather than um, you know the program itself. Essentially, what you have is uh, an employer that has to ask if you have a social security number, uh, and uh, if that uh, worker provides you one, um, the U the U.S. government or the H-2A program can only say whether or not that social security number exists. 
not whose name is under it, not if they ever, there are six people using it. So trying to get that program modified and, uh, and fixed. And then also the two things uh, on temporary workers, a 12-month visa for contracted workers and an 11-month visa for uh, workers who work with, a, with no contract. And so again, working in on the temporary worker side, not necessarily coming in with a permanent um, uh, agricultural worker program. It's more so focused on the temporary worker side. So that's what American Farm Bureau has been working on. And um, I'd be happy to take any more questions as we move forward. I forgot to mention during the Farm Bill uh, discussion um, that livestock disaster programs are also a part of trying to uh, find some funding for these programs under the agricultural appropriations work. Uh, that we're going to try to do, um, and uh, we're going to try to find some funding for those. They were not they, the programs were re, were reauthorized during the uh, at the end of last year, but there was no funding attached to those programs. So trying to find a way to get those programs funded is going to be another high priority for us. So just wanted to throw that out there. I'll take any questions on anything that anyone has. Okay, are there any questions for Jordan? I'm not seeing any, but uh, once again, if you do have a question, uh, there is a question box that you can type in your question, and I will see it and be able to read it to Jordan. And we do have one here from uh, Jeff Metz. Uh, it's USDA's final rule on animal ID is very close to Nebraska Farm Bureau's policy, but in the future, what can we expect pertaining to the exemptions on feeder cattle, and what's the timeline being discussed? It's a good question, Jeff. Um, Right now, what we've seen is it, it, does mono, it does mirror our policy, where we like the exemption for cattle uh, under 18 months of age. The problem is, is that, like, like Jeff kind of alluded to, it is only temporary. Um, and so I think that what we were, the impression that we were under is that it was going to take a couple years for USDA. They wanted to know that the program that they were initiating for basically all other cattle uh, was working and we can have differing opinions as to whether they'll actually find out whether or not the program will be working. But um, I'd say we have a couple years. Now, the, the thing that we will be pushing on is to try to make sure that exemption stays. It, it's going to be a tough fight. I, I, will, I will not, uh, um, I'm not going to pretend on that one. That one's going to be tough to try to get that exemption to stay, specifically if USDA believes their program is working. Uh, and if they think it's working, then it's, you know, and I, and I definitely understand the problems that exist with that. And we're going to try to make those concerns known as perfectly clear as we can. The problem is, is that USDA decided that they were going to not necessarily, I need to read the reg again, but I don't think they were going to undertake, you know, bringing in 18-month and younger cattle um, into the program by a separate rulemaking process. They were just going to essentially just kind of do it when they kind of when they wanted to and so um, we're going to try to work uh, with USDA as best we can to try to uh, stop this to stop the inclusion of, of younger cattle um, before they just try to, to try to throw them in there but I, I, I will be the first to admit that it's going to be tough. Okay we have another question this one's from Larry Musak um, and he wants to know will money be taken from the crop insurance program? So um, I think uh, kind of the, the, the talk has been, you know, last year and a little bit now this year again, if, if, you, could be, if you could be two programs within, uh, within this new farm bill, uh, one would be the sugar program because there's no change, and then number two would be federal crop insurance because actually federal crop insurance gains some funding. Uh, we did some changes here and there that I think are very positive to agriculture, specifically one being um, the ability to certify irrigated versus non-irrigated acres uh, through through RMA. Uh, and so you can have, you can actually certify the difference there, which should help you all um, who have both irrigated and non-irrigated uh, uh, acres. Um, and so I think crop insurance is safe for now. However, um, the question will be, how much crop insurance is targeted after this new farm bill goes through, and then how much it's going to be targeted during the next farm bill debate. That's going to be number one. And I will guarantee you that as we move forward, farmers will be asked to absorb more of the cost of their premium for federal crop insurance. And so 
I think it's it's up to us to continue to have this conversation and do some some work on finding what level of subsidization of that premium is is required is necessary for us to continue to utilize crop insurance and and then also um, you know make sure that the program remains uh, affordable for farmers but also is acceptable as it can be to the American taxpayer so um, I think it's okay for now the question will be the next farm bill and and in between time in these in these next five years after we get a farm bill done what it looks like okay are there any other questions for for Jordan or uh, Jay Rempe or Anthony Arts are still here, and Steve is still here. So if you have a question for Steve, he'd be happy to answer that too. And again, you can type your question in the question box, or you can raise your hand if you're if you have a microphone on your computer. Oh, we do have a question from Ron Smith. Um, this question is: Do you have any idea how how much do ag producers pay in state income taxes um, in dollars compared to what we may have to pay in area sales taxes? or an extra sales taxes? Uh, great question. The last data we have for uh, income taxes paid by farmers and ranchers was from 2010, and in that year they paid $63 million in, in income taxes. The estimates that we've seen on the, on the uh, uh, sales tax side would suggest statewide, uh, I, I think on the, on the broad plan or the big plan, LB405 at a minimum, probably $280 million. Uh, I, I think that's probably a little underestimating or a little conservative uh, because I, I, the Department of Revenue, I'm, you know, when you're trying to estimate the amount of taxes on something that you don't collect now, it's, it's very difficult. So I, I'm thinking that's on the conservative side. Just uh, So that's statewide, 62 versus $280 million conservatively. Um, we've uh, asked, obviously, and I think probably some of you on, on tonight have responded, to our, our, our question about, uh, we asked people to do some quick back of the envelope figuring, and what we found there, for on average, for the people that responded to our survey, it would amount to about a $25,000 net tax increase per farm or per person that uh, responded to that. So it's in the nature of you know, five to one, if you will, a $5 of sales tax increases for $1 of relief from the income tax side. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, I am not seeing any, so I think we'll give it back to. Yep. I'm gonna let Jay. I think has something else he wants to share with everybody. So go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna be shameless here, Jay, and do an advertisement for our legislative conference coming up on starting on February 14th at 10:30 in the morning here at Lincoln at the Embassy Suites. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to bring in, uh, come into Lincoln and uh, get the latest on some issues. We launched with uh, Jim Wiesmeyer, is that how I pronounce that, Jordan? Jim Wiesmeyer, who's a national syndicated columnist on farm bill and ag policy issues, and he's going to uh, tell us if Jordan was right or wrong tonight on the, on the farm bill. And we'll kick off there, and then we have a host of other speakers, and it's a chance for, it's February 14th, it's Valentine's Day, you can bring your spouse in and spend an evening in Lincoln. We'll provide hors d'oeuvres and, and drinks at a reception, and then you can go out for a wonderful dinner. So, But uh, we would sure love to have everybody come. We particularly this year want to encourage people to come, uh, particularly the reception with the governor's sales tax or tax reform plans. Uh, we need your help to reach out to your state senator and the governor, uh, any elected official you can, and tell them that this is a bad idea, that uh, this is something we shouldn't pursue. And uh, we're, we're certainly interested in tax reform, but we've got to talk property taxes as part of that. So we certainly we want to encourage members to come in and, uh, and come to the conference and uh, attend the, the reception so you can get a chance to talk to your state senator about that. And if for some reason your state senator is not going to attend the reception, we'll try to make some arrangements where we can get you to the Capitol to talk to your state senator. This is that important of an issue for us uh, as we've talked. I talked just a bit ago of the dollars that are riding on the line and the potential tax increases for agriculture, it, they're tremendous. So please uh, please seriously consider about coming into the conference. We would love to have you. Uh, I think you would learn, learn a lot. We've got a lot of good speakers. And if you're interested, I'll uh, please get a hold of Whitney Kelly in our department uh, and, and get, a, get a reservation. 
Her phone number is area code 402-421-4760, and we'd love to have you. Particularly, even if you could only come in for the first day, I guess, and, and attend the reception to a chance to speak with your senator on, on this tax reform issue. It's, it's that vitally important that we get as many people in here as we can. So with that, I'll, I'll stop my shameless plug for our legislative conference, and I'll turn it back over to Steve. Uh, nope, there are uh, no other questions, but uh, so we'll let Steve go. But if you do have another question, we still have time while we're all still here. Oh, go ahead, Steve. All right, well, certainly I want to thank everyone for, for participating tonight. Uh, I hope that this uh, setting of, of uh, the webinar setting is good for you. I think it uh, certainly has the uh, has opportunity to save uh, save people from having to travel to a site or uh, that kind of thing. So if uh, if if uh, that is the case, well, I'd like to have you let us know. If there's something that didn't work well for you as part of the webinar too, please let us know because we want to make this uh, uh, better and better. We think this is going to be a good way for uh, us to communicate the issues. Uh, I would reiterate the things that Jay talked about in relation to the legislative conference. I think uh, certainly a great lineup of presenters and uh, more importantly the opportunity to visit with your senator and talk about your feelings about the tax uh, proposal that the governor has made is very important and, and uh, again if there's anything that we can do to help facilitate that conversation uh, please let us know. We plan uh, additional uh, legislative updates via webinar. The next one we have scheduled for Tuesday, uh, February 26. We're going to do that at 8.30 a.m. Central Time. That would be 7.30 Mountain Time. Uh, that may work better for some, may not work as well for others, but we're going to try some different times here and see if, uh, if we can meet everyone's needs that way. We are also planning uh, uh, additional updates in uh, March and April, so uh, watch for those those times as well. Uh, in addition to that, we do have some regional meetings coming up, and uh, those meetings are going to be uh, in McCook, Valentine, and Norfolk. Yeah. Okay, we do have uh, dates for those Thursday, February 21st in McCook. Wednesday, February 27th in Valentine, and March 28th is in Norfolk. And so we'll have more information coming out as we move forward on these. These will uh, uh, include uh, information related to drought and a number of other things. Uh, so uh, please watch for, for that information and take advantage of, of attending those meetings. I'd like to thank, uh, again, those of the us that are in the room here. Uh, Jay Rampey, Jay Ferris, Jordan Dix, and Anthony Arts for all of your hard work in uh, both in your day-to-day -day work and in, in putting uh, materials together for this webinar. And so I think uh, I think we're done here. And again, hopefully, hopefully this, this has been a very, very good use of your time, time and we look forward, look forward to, to uh, doing, doing this again. And I just keep saying over and over again, if there's anything that you need, please let us know. Give me a call or anyone here. Uh, we want to help you in any way that we can. So again, thank you and have a great rest of your evening. Okay, now I turned everybody on the phone. Is anybody that's still on the phone? I'm still on, Jay. Hi, Irma. Yeah, did it work for you to listen? I'm sorry you weren't able to get on on the webinar portion. Yeah, I don't know. What, I tried to hear what was like in the girls' room at the same time. Okay. <laughs> first well, things first. I'm yeah. not even going to ask if it's more interesting.
Oh, well, good. Even if you couldn't see it, uh, you were at least able to hear for on the conference right. call. So, right. um, well, thanks for giving me the numbers. Yeah, not a problem. And we'll do this again here towards the end of February, and we'll try to get you hooked up so you can watch it online or um, or this always works too, so you can uh, do it over the phone. So, thanks, Irma. Good night. Well, right on. I think y'all did a great job. By the way, I'm still sharing my screen, so if anyone's actually watching yet, they're gonna watch. I just should. They're gonna watch John McCain yell at Chuck Hagel. <laughs> I can still.